Before we get into some of the things domestic, I want to catch up because you had the uh, opportunity to go back to Afghanistan again, and you've seen it through several phases of where we've been in the last decade. Tell me what you're seeing now and as to how it compares to previous visits. You know, that's a good way to, to frame it. We're in the decisive phase of the war. Afghans are taking the lead more robustly each visit. They're more Afghan capacity. Two years ago in Kandahar, which is the spiritual home of the Taliban, this is a Pashtun civil war between the Taliban and other Pashtuns like Karzai that want to go a different way. Kandahar is where most of the fighting's at. Uh, two years ago, for every one Afghan, there were two Americans in the fight. Today, there are two Afghanistan, Afghan soldiers for every one American. So they're getting out front. They're taking more of a leadership role. Their casualties have gone up. Ours has come down because they're out into the fight more. The police had the highest polling in terms of approval rating. Since I've been going to Afghanistan, they're getting better, more professional. Right. The Koran burning was a setback, but it really does show. The one thing I tell people, Afghanistan is a place, if you're not welcomed, you don't stay very long. Uh, the reason we've been able to stay there for the last decade is people understand we're not the Russians, we're not the British Empire. So militarily, the Taliban are being punished. These night raids where we go in at night and grab these guys, it's just been a, a godsend militarily. We signed a memorandum of understanding yesterday, uh, two days ago, with the uh, Afghans to right. put them out front. Now, let's stop there for a second. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about that, because that's yeah. that's been a bone of contention that they've wanted control of night raids to basically well, eliminate them. Well, Why would we eliminate that? Well, we're not going to eliminate them. See, you got Karzai saying, you know, this is my country. you got 3,132 people in American military prison. Well, the goal has been to secure the country and turn it over to the Afghans. We've got an agreement on detention that will allow these prisoners to move over in an orderly fashion to Afghan control, but we'll be able to maintain control over the really bad ones. As far as night raids go, 40% of the raids are Afghan-generated already. We're going to put them out in the lead. The first guy to go through the door at night is not going to be an American anymore. It's going to be an Afghan. That's the way it should be. We'll be flying the helicopters. We'll be doing the intelligence gathering, but we're putting these guys out front. Their capacity on the night raids, their special forces, has grown, tremend grown tremendously in a year. So anytime they take the lead on something, whether they're capable of doing it, it's good news for us. All right. When it comes to the public relations battle, you and I right. have talked about this yeah. so much. Yeah. We're the greatest public relations country in the history of the world in terms right. of, of, of Madison Avenue, and yet we get our butt kicked every <laughs> single day yeah. on by the Taliban, well, by al-Qaeda, when it comes to our own uh, beating, our, beating ourselves up with with. Public relations. Well, that's a good point. If I were sitting at home watching Afghanistan on the TV, I think this place is a, a mess beyond recovery, beyond repair. And that's really not true. The closer you get to Afghanistan, the better it looks. But if you're watching American television, reading the American newspapers, you think, well, this is a hopeless endeavor. But once you go there, and if you go there enough, you can see progress. The goal is to withdraw with honor and security. We've got a plan in place. General Allen is a great general, the equal of General Petraeus, which is saying a lot. Sure is. So in 2014, we're going to draw our troops down, and the key to Afghanistan is to have a follow-on force. We don't have anybody in Iraq, and it's going to show over time. But we can go from 68,000 this October, withdraw that force over the next couple of years. We need about 20,000 after 2014, two or three air bases spread out through the country with special forces, fighter jets, uh, attack helicopters, logistical support, then the Afghan security forces, with our help, with that counterterrorism footprint, will never be able to be defeated by the Taliban, and that will be the end of the Taliban's dreams of coming back militarily. Then what they'll do is start reconciling, and the ones that won't reconcile will kill or capture. So the goal is to let the Afghans know we're not leaving after 2014, let the Iranians know we don't abandon allies, Tell the Pakistanis, when you bet on the Taliban, you're betting on a loser. And let everybody who knows, who's been helping us in the last decade, know we're not going to leave you. We're going to have a small military footprint, political economic relationship that goes for at least another decade. And that will be the end of the Taliban. And we can draw, withdraw our troops, come home with honor and security. How much does that get impacted by what happens in November in the election? Well, I think President Obama owns this war unlike Iraq. He, he said this was the good war. I'm hoping that we'll have a strategic partnership agreement that lays out what I just described uh, in the next month or two. There's a NATO conference in Chicago at the end of May. My hope is that by the end of May, we'll have a, 
an agreement signed with the Afghans saying that we will have an enduring relationship. We're not going to abandon Afghanistan. There will be a security component to this relationship that at, at the Chicago NATO conference, other NATO nations will say, hey, we're not leaving either. We're going to provide trainers, political, economic support to the Afghans. Uh, if we did that, then the Taliban would be demoralized and those who've been helping us would be emboldened. And that would be the end of the Taliban as mm. a military force. And that's the way to end this war. See, it does matter what happens in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is the place we're attacked from. And if we'd had some special forces units there after the Russians left, there had never been a Taliban takeover. So let's look at this as an insurance policy. I think President Obama will do what I just described. I hope so. Let me move on to uh, things a little bit more domestically, although everything happening in the Middle East impacts this. <laughs> Gas prices, you know, I, I've been saying, and, and you and I have been visiting on this program for the better part of 12, 13 yeah, years now. Right. I have said to you for 13 years, let's drill here, let's drill now, let's drill safely. I mean, all yeah. the key little buzzwords that you're supposed to use. Senator, uh, it hasn't happened. We haven't done it. What do you think we could do if we were to say, starting tomorrow, to impact our own gas prices and, and just to give a little more control to ourselves in this country. Well, oil and gas are commodities. The more of it, the less it costs, right? You would think. Yeah. Okay, look at the oil sands up in... Um, we're about 3 million barrels a day below um, what we need to be. And you can get about 750,000 barrels a day just from Canada. Build the pipeline, for God's sakes, from Canada down to the Gulf Coast that's 20,000 jobs, and it will be about 750,000 barrels of oil a day will generate in the future from Canada. Anwar is another 750,000 barrels. Off the East Coast, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, 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 Virginia, maybe Georgia, the Eastern Gulf for sure, there's a lot of untapped oil and gas resources. If the president decided tomorrow that we would aggressively open up the continental shelf, Anwar, and uh, built a pipeline from Canada, you'd see a dramatic drop in gas prices simply because of future supply. All right, let's say, hypothetically, that Mitt Romney defeats Barack Obama. Yeah. Do you think you'll see more of that push? If, if he does, then he's missing a huge opportunity. What I tried to do a, several years ago with Lieberman uh, and Kerry was to do a kind of a comprehensive deal. You got the environmental community who wants us to move, move away from fossil fuel. You don't have to agree with global warming to understand that the more fossil fuel we use, the more dangerous it is for us as a nation. You know, wouldn't you love to be able to go to the Mideast one day and say, we'd like to help you, but we don't need your oil? So the idea of getting off fossil fuels as a, as a source of fuel is a good idea, but it's going to be generations. So let's find as much of it as we can on our shores that we control and try to find technology to, to reduce demand for fossil fuel. So what I wanted to do is expand nuclear power on the production side, Building nuclear power plants is a great way to create jobs in America and become energy independent. Use coal. Just make it cleaner coal. Gas is the bridge fuel. It's cleaner than coal. We have more of it than any place in the world. So let's go find the gas through fracking, do it in an environmentally sure, sound way. Sure. So if I were Romney, I would promise an energy independence initiative, and I would lay out what I've just said. Under Romney presidency, we're going to explore off the continental shelf. We're going to open up the eastern gulf. We're going to open up Anwar. We're going to build a pipeline from Canada, and at the same time, we're going to expand our nuclear power footprint to create jobs and independent source of energy. And we're also going to move into the alternative energy arena with wind, uh, solar, uh, the other technologies, hybrid cars. Just do all the above. See, when Obama says all the above, it's something he knows he has to say politically. I don't think it comes from his heart. It's words out of his mouth, not from his heart. I think when Romney says all the above, he really means it. We're talking with Senator Lindsey Graham for a few minutes uh, and staying on, on the economy and on gas prices, things like that. Uh, in, all, in order to get a lot of what we've talked about done, it's going to be not just an election in November for a president, but also uh, trying to get control of the, the Senate and, and holding the House. Exactly. I know both you and Senator DeMint are putting a lot of energy, time, money, everything you can toward helping to try to get Republicans to control the Senate. He Tell me, well, before we get into the strategy there, my question to you is you've been in the Senate long enough that you've seen the Democrats and the Republicans both have control. You are so much less powerful. I don't mean Lindsey yeah. Graham, but I mean the no, party right. can't get anything done unless you guys can get control. There are two numbers you need to remember when it comes to the Senate, 51 and 60. Uh, not being a committee chairman uh, matters. We could set the agenda. If I were the committee chairman, 
on the committees uh, that I now serve on, I would have different hearings. We would be pushing legislation that goes nowhere now. So being the chairman of a committee, having 51 Republicans, means that we can coordinate with the House. Let's say the House stays in Republican hands. If you had a House uh, in Republican hands and a Senate in Republican hands, the bills that are coming out of the House that die in the Senate would at least get a vote. Now, how would the Democrats block legislation? They'd have to get 40 of them to filibuster. Well, that will get old after a while. So if we had both chambers, the House and the Senate, the legislation that's good for job creation and cutting taxes and all the reforms we need coming out of the House would not die in the Senate. It would come to the floor for a vote, and it would be a dramatic change in the ability to create policy. And if you had a Republican president who would sign uh, these bills, uh, it would change the dynamic dramatically. So 51 puts you in charge of the committees, lets you partner with the House. 60 is the magic number, but I think we could get eight or nine Democrats on any given day to vote with us. What we talked about being such an important election in November, I've called it the most important election of my lifetime, at least uh, in my 43 years. And and I, I look at it as, as it's not too late to fix things that have gone astray, but oh, it's no. getting there. But but it's, time is a, a wonderful commodity to have, and yeah. you should use it wisely in your personal life, your business life, and sure. your political career. If President Obama gets reelected, Obamacare, I don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do. I hope they strike it down. But a lot of his EPA policies, which are really making it tough on business, the regulatory side of government, right? Uh, all of that grows and it gets to be more oppressive. The idea of having an increased tax uh, on people who create jobs is more of a reality. The reason our economy is stagnant and growing at a very small pace is because who in their right mind would hire a bunch of people now, not knowing what your health care bill is going to be because of Obamacare looming over you in 2014? Who in their right mind would hire a bunch of people not knowing what the regulatory environment is going to be. The Bush tax cuts expire in uh, the end of this year. So I don't think you're going to have a an economy that can break loose until the policies of Obama are replaced, quite frankly. Right. So this is the hard thing to ask and the hard thing to say. But I, I made my confession on the air that – and I've ne- and you know me. You know me a lot of years <laughs> Absolutely. now. Absolutely. I am not someone that put politics ahead of what's best for America. And I said I years ago, that. if Barack Obama can turn this thing around, I said I'll vote for him for yeah. crying out loud. God bless him, whatever. Well, I've tried to help. I know you have. And others have, have stepped up and tried sure. to be nonpartisan yeah. and just say this is what's best for America. Okay, all that aside, if we get to Labor Day, if things are still the way they are right mm-hmm. now with gas prices continuing to surge, with all of uh, our small businesses struggling the way they are, I'm out there saying this right now. And that is I want us to tank. I want it to tank until, from Labor Day until Election Day. And I know that's a hard thing for no, me to say. No, I mean you want to replace President Obama. Yeah, it's a long-term it's, investment well, at that point. he's had three and a half years now. And the hope that he generated in 2008 has been replaced by cynicism and skepticism. Yeah. He turned over the agenda. He had 60 senators in the Senate, and he had a big majority in the House. He could have passed any piece of legislation he chose to. Instead of governing from the left ditch, if he had come to the middle, he'd be unbeatable. Obamacare, which is a complete takeover medicine as we know it by the federal government, passed on a party-line vote. The stimulus, three Republicans voted for the stimulus package. If it had a stimulus bill where Senator McCain had a $480 billion stimulus package, if he had met us in the middle, things would have been different. But he turned his agenda over to Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid, and from day one, he's governed from the left ditch, and he ran as a centrist. And that's why I think he'll lose. His biggest problem is that the guy that ran for president in 2008 never showed up in the White House, and he has been uh, more partisan instead of less partisan. Look at the health care bill. Remember he promised us that it would be passed through negotiations on C-SPAN? Sure. That they would be no more behind-the-scene deals? Right. Five well, days for you to review everything? Yeah, all that well, stuff. what happened with the health care bill? It was on party-line vote, passed in the middle of the night, Christmas, Christmas Eve, Eve in the right. Senate, yeah. and the 60th vote was bought through the Cornhusker kickback in the Louisiana Purchase. Everything that was bad about Washington was on display in terms of the process, And the bill itself is just a breathtaking overreach by the federal government. So that one case study of Obamacare shows you his problems. Now, here's our hurdle. We're going to have to perform better with Hispanic voters. It's the fastest-growing demographic in America. 
We're doing very well uh, with, uh, with independent voters, but we're down to 23% with Hispanic voters. We need to get that up to about 40 And the one thing I would say to our Hispanic uh, friends out there is that President Obama promised you and the country comprehensive immigration reform in the first year. Instead, you got Obamacare. He did nothing. He's done nothing on immigration but demagogue it. So I hope our nominee for president, and it will be Romney, will challenge him on immigration and say, on my watch, we're actually going to fix the problem in a way that will allow us as a country to move on and not have 12 million illegal immigrants 20 years from now. But that's the one problem we have with the electorate that we've got to fix. Can a vice presidential nominee influence that if you went with someone like a a, a Rubio or someone like that? A Rubio or a Jeb Bush. Yeah. Jeb Bush has been a great governor of Florida. He's gotten support from every corner of the state of Florida. And Florida is America in a microcosm. Rubio is a great, talented young man who uh, represents the American dream in many forms. Yes, this problem can be fixed, and you don't have to be for amnesty. You just got to talk about it and try to solve the problem in a way that makes sense, that's rational, that doesn't demagogue people, that just says, okay, we got broken borders, let's fix them. We got people hiring illegals, let's change that employer system to verifiable employment. And if you keep hiring illegals, you're going to lose your business. Let's do something rational with 11 or 12 million. But let's make sure we don't have 11 or 12 million 20 or 30 years from now by fixing the system. I just think people want some honest, straightforward talk about immigration reform. And President Obama talked a good game but did not deliver. So there's an opening there with the Hispanic community. But the vice presidential pick is very important, I think, in this election. From formulas that you, you look at. You look at, hey, if I pick someone from Florida like an Allen West right. or a Rubio, can that deliver such a huge swing state? But, but I mean, clearly... You look at Sarah Palin last time was not picked to deliver Alaska. Joe Biden was not picked to deliver Delaware. You know, that's you know? funny you mention it. I think Joe Biden was picked to, to fill in a gap, a perceived gap of Obama, you know, foreign experience, policy. Experience, foreign policy. And, and sure. I like Joe, but Joe's been wrong about a lot of things. So, But anyway, the bottom line is that's why Obama picked Biden. And Pre- uh, uh, Senator McCain picked Sarah Palin because she was a reformer, young, energetic woman, which I think would have helped our ticket after Hillary Clinton lost the Democratic nomination. In this case, Florida and Ohio are the two great prizes. we got Rob Portman from Ohio, a senator, who would be a really good pick. He's a solid guy, but you got Rubio, Bush. you you got people in Florida, you know, Alan West, that would would add to the mix. Then you got a region like the Northeast uh, where you'd have uh, Governor Christie. you got a, you know, Indiana went Democratic, you know, Mitch Daniels, who's been a great governor. And you've got the the Hispanic um, uh, governor of New Mexico, Martinez. She's a rising star. you got the guy out in uh, uh, Nevada. So we got some good picks. uh, But do you think he needs to go out of the box, or does he just go? I mean, the first rule is always don't do any harm. Right. That's a good rule for vice presidents. I think you've got – there's a regional dynamic. There are key state dynamics. First pick somebody you think that could be a good president if something happened to you. But uh, of the people I named, each one brings into play a, a region or a, a demographic or a particular state that could help us win the White House. I think a vice presidential pick can overcome some problems uh, of the candidate himself. So I think he needs to choose wisely. But the good news, I think we got a deeper vice presidential bench than we do presidential candidates. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Let me rattle off a few okay. things that require a lot of time, but we don't have a lot of time right. with Senator Graham. And just kind of give me your take on a number of things. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed finally going on trial at Guantanamo. What do you think happens there? I have been fighting for years to make sure the mastermind in 9-11 was tried by military commission because I think he's a warrior, not a common criminal. Military commissions have a role in the war against terror. We can try people like him in the military because they've uh, created war against us, not a common criminal. If he did not go to military commissions, who would? He was the mastermind of 9-11. So it reinforces the idea that we're at war. I've been a military lawyer for 30 years. He will get a very fair trial, very transparent trial at Guantanamo Bay, but we're at war. We're not fighting a common criminal. So having him in a military commission setting, I think, is very appropriate because we're a nation at war, not fighting common criminals. And uh, at the end of the day, when that trial is over, you'll be reminded what we're up against. I was at his combat status review tribunal at Guantanamo Bay when he was asked, 
are you an enemy combatant? He says, I'm the commander of the Al-Qaeda military wing. And basically, he said, I did it, and if I could, I would do it again. I hope Americans will listen to what he has to say if he speaks at that trial and remind ourselves that we're not fighting a guy that robbed a liquor store. We're fighting an idea that would come to this country and kill us all if they could. And having the military out front all over the world, along with the CIA, costs money and we get weary as a nation. But fighting those guys over there means that we don't have to fight them here. But his case, when it comes to light, sometimes this year, I hope will remind us all we're at war. Egypt. And going and putting him in yeah. federal court in New York City was the dumbest idea. <laughs> Giving that guy the rights yeah. of an American citizen, yeah. putting him in the middle of New York City, having a $350 million security footprint right. when you got a perfectly good courtroom at Guantanamo Bay, Bay made no sense. So I'm glad he's on trial in our military custody. All right. Egypt is uh, going more radicalized. It's scaring me. I know Mubarak was far from perfect, but for a lot of years, he didn't start bombing Israel and, and we That's knew what right. he was doing. We, so, you know, the Arab Spring, we'll see where it goes. Here's what's happened. The secular governments like Mubarak and Gaddafi and Assad stayed in power through corruption and oppression. Religious people did not fare very well under those regimes. Guess what? When those regimes fall, the religious people who oppose the regimes are thought of positively by the population because they were doing good things for the population. But the Muslim Brotherhood is beginning to scare the people in Egypt. So now you get this old uh, Suleiman, who was the vice president under Mubarak, running. So the secular forces in Egypt are beginning to rally and offer counter-opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood. That's called democracy. The Muslim Brotherhood... Um, has said some terrible things, and they've done some things that are not so terrible in terms of trying to engage with us. If they tear up the treaty with Israel, then that would be a huge blow to stability in the Mideast. I don't think they will. I think you can have a spirited election in Egypt, and if the Muslim Brotherhood is smart and they gain power at the presidential level in the parliament, they will grow the economy because here's what they face. If they don't deliver for the Egyptian people, they're going to get kicked out too. Israel. Will they, uh, will they do something before or after our election? Do you think that they've been asked basically stay away from anything until after the election? Well, I know Obama's asked them that, but Israel should never agree to do what America asks. They should do what's best for Israel. Sure. If you're the Israeli prime minister, how much longer do you let this go? There's a round of talks beginning this week with Iran about their nuclear program. We have talked to death. You know, I am convinced they're going to use this as a way to delay the implementation of a nuclear capability. I think their goal is to get a nuclear weapon and try to be like North Korea. Nobody will bother me once I get a nuclear weapon. But this is the last round of talks that anybody is going to tolerate, and the Israelis have got a problem on their hands. Their ability to neutralize or slow down the uh, Iranian nuclear program is limited and less capable than ours. When that window closes, or they think it's going to close, they will act. They're not going to rely on us to do it later. So at the end of the day, uh, I hope the Iranians tomorrow will say, okay, we're going to abandon our nuclear program. But that's not going to happen. Well, I would tell them, here are three things that need to happen. Here's what the president, in my view, needs to do. Communicate to the Iranians, you have 30 days to do the following three things. Let Russia and China know we need your help. But in the next 30 days, if they don't come forward and embrace the Three things. You pick them what they are that would show that the Iranian nuclear program has been stopped. Uh, then I would tell the Iranians all bets are off. I wouldn't negotiate anymore. I would give them a, basically an ultimatum. Wait, but say, haven't we done that with North Korea and you see that the no, all bets are off? I mean, come we, on. We've always given confused signals to North Korea. We'll give you food if you'll stop your nuclear program. Well, we give them the food. They continue with right. their nuclear program. Uh, at the end of the day, I think what you need to tell North Korea, if you keep developing intercontinental ballistic missile capability and you keep saber rattling, then we're going to look at you as a real threat and all options are on the table in terms of keeping your program uh, within, within a certain boundary. Unlike uh, North Korea, there will be a nuclear arms race if Iran gets a nuclear sure, weapon. Sure. I don't worry about China. I mean, China's already got nuclear weapons, Japan and South Korea. We're talking about a region around Iran that's the most volatile region in the world, sure. some of the biggest oil fields in the world, and no Arab Sunni nation is going to allow the Iranian Persians to develop a nuclear weapon without having one of their own. 
So unlike North Korea, what happens in Iran is even more pressing because it will lead to nuclear proliferation in the Mideast. And if I were president of the United States, I would communicate to the Iranians a deadline. Here are three things you must do or else. All right, last thing, I'll turn you loose. Uh, you head back to Washington after a recess. What's the next big battle? And we know it's not going to be a budget because obviously well, that's never going to happen. That, isn't that disappointing? You know, we don't have a budget in the Senate. I think the next big battle is going to be over uh, how you fund the government. You know, the government, we have, a, we have an agreement, an om- omnibus bill that runs out at the end of September. The next big battle is how do we keep the government running? How many appropriations bills will we pass? But they're going to bring up the Buffett rule. And that's such a in- disingenuous concept. The, the Buffett rule is that a uh, millionaire, billionaire should pay no less than their secretary. Well, at the, po- the point is that he gets most of his income, Warren Buffett, through capital gains. Right. He's already paid personal income taxes uh, on the money he made, and when you invest it into a capital gains asset, you pay 15% on top of the 35%. So the fact that he makes most of his money through capital gains, which is a lower rate, is really a disingenuous argument. you got to make the money to begin with before you can invest it, then it's taxed at a higher sure. rate. But we're going to get through that whole process. Most Republicans will vote against this as a phony, phony deal. Uh, I think the big argument is going to be how do we keep the government running? And my number one reason for living in 2012 as a senator is to stop sequestration. This idea, the super committee failed. We're supposed to take $600 billion out of the DOD's budget beginning next January. Uh, Leon Panetta said, if you take $600 billion out of the defense budget over the next decade, on top of the $400 billion we're already looking at, you will destroy the Defense Department. We'll have the smallest Navy since 1915, the smallest Army since 1940, and the smallest Air Force in the history of the nation. So what I'm going to try to do is come up with a substitute for sequestration. This idea that if the Super Committee failed, we would take $600 billion out of the defense, $600 billion out of non-defense, that is a dumb way to reduce spending. What you do with spending is you set priorities, then you try to work around the priorities and you reduce spending. But this idea of cutting the Defense Department blindly by a trillion dollars over the next decade when we're facing multiple defense threats is stupid. So I'm going to try, along with Joe Wilson and others, to stop sequestration from going into place because because if it does, you're talking about gutting the military. Glad you came by. I appreciate the time. Thank you.